All right. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be back. I've been gone for a little bit and a few weeks, but it's great to be back. I heard John Griffith gave a strong word last week to wrap up our series on 1 John. Uh, But today, like Michaela said, we're starting a new series in Isaiah. Now, I don't know if you've ever read much of the Old Testament, but Isaiah... uh, actually is one of my favorite books, and actually not the whole book of Isaiah because it's rather long, it's 66 chapters, but actually the middle section that we're going to be dialoguing over the next five weeks is really one of my favorite sections in all of Scripture. Actually, it's been uh, arguably one of the most beautiful poems ever written of humankind, Isaiah 40 through 55, and that's where we're going to zone in on. And uh, let me pray before we dive in. Lord God, thank you for your eternal word. Father, that we came here to hear your word and to be with you. And Father, we're all in different places, but God, I pray that you would meet us right where we're at and lead us further into you, into your plans and purposes for our life, that we may be your children in this generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, just to give a little background of Isaiah, um, whenever we kind of dive into a new section of Scripture, it's always good to kind of get a little background, get a little context about what's going on. So Isaiah, he was called to his prophetic ministry in about uh, 740 B.C., and he calls this prophet to speak both to Israel and to Judah, which at that time had been divided. It used to be one nation of Israel, and now it had been divided. And so God calls Isaiah to speak to both nations and that they were that God's judgment was going to come over their rebellion, that they were bowing down and yielding to pagan religion and idol worship, and God had something to say about it. And so here's a little breakdown of our book. Uh, we kind of start in chapter 1. God is uh, declaring through kind of chapter 1 through 12 that God's promise is that through Israel, he's going to somehow bring blessing and salvation to the nations. So God declares from chapter 1 through 12, this is my purpose for you. But he was going to bring about that only after Yahweh brought about a great act of justice against all the rebellious nations. And that's from 13 to 27. These nations are rebelling against God. They're going to receive his judgment as well as an act of judgment against Israel from 27 to 39 or 28 to 35. I'll, that's a little bit different of outline than I have here. But anyway, to, uh, 28 to 39 is basically God addressing just Israel, just Judah, my people. And there's a big divide in the book of Isaiah in between chapter 39 and chapter 40. It's interesting. Chapter 1 through 39, the perspective is Isaiah... Speaking before the exile, speaking before, this is God's word to you, there's time to repent, turn around. But then in chapter, in between 39 and 40, there's a big transformation, the perspective changes. Um, How are we going to be guided by God, uh, by Yahweh when we're sitting in exile? They're now in exile. And in chapter 40, the perspective of the prophet is looking back on the exile as if it's already happened. So 1 through 39 hasn't happened yet. And then all of a sudden in chapter 40, it's now kind of looking back and, hey, we're now in exile. What's what's God's word for us while we're in exile? They're in exile in Babylon, which was one of the most, which is the most powerful nation at the time. They had come and defeated Israel and taken them into captivity. And that means for anybody in the ancient Near East world that the Babylon gods are stronger than Yahweh. That's what that would declare. Babylon has now conquered Israel, therefore their gods must be more powerful than Yahweh. Yet the prophet, poet of Isaiah, he laughs at these Babylonian gods. Things that have gone, they, they've gone horribly wrong, and Yahweh appears to be powerless But make no mistake, what it looks like is not the way it is. Yahweh is the most powerful God. And what we must capture is things have gone off the rails with Israel continually, giving themselves over to these lesser gods, to these idols, 
And what you will see is that Israel has for sure been fully compromised. And this whole big picture of this section, the poem of God is saying, actually, it's okay. I'm in charge. And we're going to sort the situation out together. I know about your failure. I see all of your failure. Now I'm going to do something. And that's God's declaration in this section. I know about your brokenness. I know about your failure. Now I am going to do something. God's not giving up on his creation. He's not giving up on his covenant. He's going to reorient, and beginning in chapter 40, he's going to be reorient his people around this servant. And in this section of 40 to 55, the word servant comes up a ton. It's actually a big theme of this whole section. Now, there's certain times that uh, Isaiah is speaking to Israel as being the servant, the nation serving God's purposes in the nation. But then there's very distinctly other times where he's not speaking about a nation. He's speaking about a coming one, a coming Messiah that would come and reestablish a new covenant so that your brokenness would not throw off God's will and plan for humankind. So, this servant's going to come up numerous times. We're going to first see it in chapter 42, but we're just going to focus on chapter 40 today. So, that's just a little, little, uh, little free nugget right there. Um, but this comports with the section in Ezekiel, which is another prophet in the Old Testament. In Ezekiel 43, this prophet has this vision of God's presence, this river flowing out of the temple and into the nations, that this river would flow and bring healing to the nations. And yet at this time, God's presence had left the temple. His presence is not there. And so they're all wondering, when God, when is your presence going to come back in the temple? And when are you going to restore all things? And so Yahweh himself is going to come and rescue. The people are powerless in their brokenness. And it's going to be God who will do what has to be done because he comes as a judge and savior to win his people back to himself. This prophetically powerful poem from God is good news for people lacking hope. It's great news, actually. The Creator God is coming back, and He's going to rescue His people. So get the red carpet ready. The King is coming. So with that as an intro, let's start. Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all of her sins. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill the valleys, level the mountains and hills, straighten the curves, smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. That's another theme that we find through this whole section is comfort. They're now in exile. They've been dispersed all throughout Babylon. They don't have a homeland anymore. Their temple has been destroyed. They have no anchor for their soul other than God's word to say, comfort, comfort. I'm here to bring you comfort in a land of hardness. Yahweh is coming. So clear clear, clear the way. Remove any hindrance. Remove, you know, lower the mountains, up the valleys. Make a straight path for the Lord. The whole creation is going to see this, and it is not going to be a hidden thing. Verse 6, a voice said, shout. I asked, what should I shout? Shout that people are like grass. Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in a field. The grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintop, shout it louder, O Jerusalem, shout and do not be afraid. What powerful words from a God who's who's coming to a people who are completely broken. And he's saying there's no victory looking to humans because they grow and they fade as you do. But the everlasting faithful God will come through. We see this uh, phrase, the word of the Lord stands forever in verse 8. 
Isaiah is going to book, uh, bookend this whole section from 40 to 55 that his word stands forever. We find in 55 that his word is powerful. It doesn't return void, but it accomplishes his purpose for which it was sent. God is dictating or telling his people that his word is everlasting. His covenant never ends. Verse 10, then the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock as a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. So here is your God. He's coming back. But there's this double portrait. He's both coming in supernatural judgment level power, and yet he's tender like a shepherd and gracious. It's like Jesus was full of grace and truth. Remember, his people, upon hearing Isaiah's words, are now scattered all over Babylon. He was calling them to return to the promised land. Come on home. I've got, I've got plans that I want executed. Stop bowing to these little gods. When Yahweh is the one and only God, the sole creator, the ruler of all things, he is the Lord of the nations. And in this, his heart to the nation of Israel is stop thinking about the little, about as a, stop thinking that you're a little people clinging to what was once yours. You know, there's a posture of our heart when we lose something. Maybe it's a relationship or maybe it's a career path that we thought was going to be the one and we, we lose it or uh, we make a mistake and we try to come back and we can live under this, I'm just trying to get back. I'm just trying to get back. Especially people that maybe have had a, uh, you know, a powerful encounter with the Lord in high school or college and Man, their, their time serving God was so fiery. I just want to get back. And there's something that happens over our mind when we're just trying to get back. A lot of our country is in this same kind of mentality. I just want to get back. But in that mindset, you, you delude yourself into what really is going on, the reality of the situation. God is moving you forward, and we can spend dreaming about the past. And God is like, no, I'm going to get a hold of you now, and I'm going to do more in and through you than you could ever dare to think or imagine, according to my power at work within you. But I need you to stop thinking about yourself as little and trying to reattain what you once had. I'm leading you into a better future, into a greater future, and I need you to get your eyes off of you and onto my greater plans that are, that are at work in the midst of of you being in exile. He's the living God without rival. Don't get deluded by these idols or these lesser gods in your land. Isaiah 40, verse 21. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? Some rhetorical questions. Meaning you should remember this. You should know this. You know this already. I'm just calling it into your imagination, into your memory. You know this. Don't forget it. C.S. Lewis in the screw tape letters, uh, one of the things he said was this. So often we imagine the devil does his best by putting ideas into our heads. Actually, he does a lot of it by keeping ideas out of our heads. So instead of you thinking like, Man, the enemy's just going to sow some bad ideas. Usually your resistance is pretty well aware and discerning enough for you to, but he can keep things out of your head, can keep you th not remembering what God's done, his faithfulness, how he's come through. When you cried out to him, it may not have happened the way you envisioned it had happened, but he came through. Remember, think of who your God actually is. It is foolish, foolishness of believing God will forget you. He is the everlasting God, a God without rival. He neither faints nor grows weary, but gives you strength. And that's what the prophet Isaiah says here. It says, O oh, Israel, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? How can you say the Lord refuses to hear your case? 
Have you never heard or understood? Don't you know that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth? He never grows faint or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives powers to those who are tired and worn out. He offers strength to the weak. Even youths will become exhausted and young men will give up. Yet, yet, yet those who wait on the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Powerful words. Strung together to paint a picture of this great God, Yahweh, that He gives power to those who are tired and worn out. He's not one that He counsels us for wisdom. We counsel Him for wisdom. And it says He offers strength to the weak. Even youths will become exhausted and young men will give up. It's a picture of one trying to live by their own strength, their own white knuckling. I'm going to make this happen. This is the desire and ambition of my heart, and I'm going to go out and conquer it. And people that live with that mindset can only live with that mindset for so long because they'll, they'll burn out. Life will hit them harder than they can have the ability to respond and counteract. And so where does our strength come from? Our strength comes from God. And it says, yet those, yet those who wait on the Lord. This is a place where one relinquishes their plans so God may do something greater. Waiting on the Lord. The former live there in their natural strength, like I said, but the waiters live in God's sufficient supernatural strength. You've heard of having a saving faith probably heard that phrase, been around the church. In a similar way, there's waiting faith, a faith that relies on the and recalls the record of what is, God has done and declared, and you stand on those truths. Rather than relying on human strength and endeavor, waiting on God allows one to get twisted up into. And that's, that's really the meaning behind the word wait. Kava is the Hebrew word. It means to wait eagerly for, to linger for, to bind together. And the word picture is like getting twisted up into. And so when you're waiting on the Lord, it's not just passively, like with your arms crossed, hey God, this is what I want done. I'm waiting on you. No, that's not what waiting is. Biblically waiting is I'm anticip- I'm, I'm getting bound up together with God's heart and His will and His life as we're waiting together to accomplish His will. And so it's waiting on the Lord is anything but passive. It's an active reliance and that knowing that His sufficiency is going to uh, fill any deficiency in your life. This is what God is doing with His people here, to get bound up together with me. While you're in exile, get bound up together with me. When our heart and our life and the world around us is pushing and tempting us not to wait on God, it is His faith-filled people that sees life through the grid of the promise-giving, covenant-keeping God. Okay, the world may see it as X, but as God's child, I feel like that X is under certain kind of deception. And so therefore, as God's people, God's person... I need to rely on His Word to give me reality of what really is going on. And I'm standing on His Word. Faith is the convinced, convicted heart reaching out to the living God to readily receive His free grace and supply. Whatever you may need, God wants to give it. This promise is for all those who are His. There's this phrase, walk by faith and not by sight. Walking and in this Walking and not fainting. Yet those who wait on the Lord will find new strength. They'll soar high on wings like eagles. This new strength, this walking and not fainting. This this is a picture of the steady tread of faithful obedience. It's not sprinting. It's not like, man, this thing, I'm just giving it my all. This This is a marathon. This is a journey of God authoring and finishing your faith. 
And this steady tread of faithful obedience is just walking and not fainting. I'm just walking in faithful obedience to the Lord. The servant shepherd who's gentle with us is always the one who is also the one who comes with power and his strong arm rules us. He's with us and his strength will be ours too. And as I was reading this, I was just struck. I mean, this seems so much like Jesus. When he's speaking in Matthew 11, he says, Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Is this not the shepherd that is taking the lambs in his arms? Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. It feels like for some that just upon hearing those words, there's just this cry of your heart of like, I want that. I've had that maybe in the past, but I'm not trying to go back. I'm trying to help God reestablish a spirit of confidence, a spirit of peace, a spirit of faith in me. And so here's Jesus with this open invitation. If life has gotten you burdened, if your own brokenness and sin is weighing you down, come to Jesus. He's actually the servant Isaiah is speaking of. That's a little... Uh, cat out of the bag a little bit. We were going to save that for Easter, but, you know, you guys are a bright bunch, so I think you can pretty much fill it in before then. But his yoke is easy. And so let us catch what God's saying to the people of Israel. This is specifically to this audience of the nation of Israel. But let's catch what God's saying to us as well. Come to Yahweh. Who can compare to him? Idols? These other gods of money and sex and pleasure, you think that can compare with the Almighty God who brings healing, who brings abundant life, who brings peace beyond understanding? And yet our heart cries out for those things, and we search for those things in every different way out in the world, and yet we're hesitant to come to God. And so here's God's word just saying, don't get deceived by the gods of Babylon Come back to me. I'm way more powerful than them anyway. He is the provider and supplier of everything you need to be his sons and daughters and to reflect him to the whole world. He's the one that provides it. Isn't that good news? That it's not you doing religious duty or you doing kind of religious things, but it's you in your own heart crying out, God, I need you. God, I repent of my sin. God, I I repent of my own pride and my own self-reliance. God, I need you. I'm desperate for you. Things actually may be going really good. God, this is the moment I really need you. Sometimes we only cry out to God when things are kind of hit the fan. And then you're like, God, I really need you. And yeah, God comes through, but is that a relationship? Is that a love relationship? Or is this just kind of a religious relationship? A love relationship is, man, I want to be with you every day. I want to know your heart. I want to get to know you. I want to know your passions as you get to know me. I mean, he knows me fully already. He's just helping me get to know me, actually. I love his word. It cuts through all the crap and lets us see our lives before him. And here's this beautiful invitation. Come to me, all who are weary, that you might find rest for your souls. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, God, that, Lord, that you give comfort to a hopeless people. Father, you give strength to the weary. You give vision for the visionless. Father, you bring life to the dead. And, Father, if we're here and we know that, God, we, we aren't in relationship with you, God. We know that we are not fully friends or, or you're not fully Lord or there's a distance in between us. If that's you, I feel like God's invitation to you is that today is the day to remove those barriers so that you actually find the God that you're looking for. And so this little first part of this prayer, I just want to kind of focus on people in this position. Father, I know I don't know you. 
I know I may have grown up hearing you. I know a lot about you. But, God, I know in my heart I actually don't know you. So, Father, I repent of my pride, my rebellion, my sin, my own way of thinking, my own desire to be God, of defining what is right and wrong. God, that's not my job. That's yours. And, God, if I've been in the place of judge over you, over your words, God, I repent in the name of Jesus. Father, I recognize that you are the creator. I am the creation. You are the one with all wisdom. I am an ignorant sheep that needs to be led by a wise shepherd. And so, Father, I give the rest of my life for you to guide me and lead me and be my leader. And let me come to know you as Jesus knew you in Jesus' name. And for us, for us others, you may have been walking with the Lord. You may have been walking numerous seasons from the Lord. But there's been something that's been kind of coming out of you that's been your own strength, that's been your own ambition, that's been your own lust for something, and it hasn't been fueled with God's strength. I feel like God wants anything in your life that you're doing that you don't feel is being fueled with God's strength and His Word and His life. I feel like God wants you to put that on the altar this morning to say, God, I'm done living in my own strength in this, and I'm giving it to you. Father, I pray that you would fill these places, fill these things in our life with your presence, with your strength. God, we're relying and we're desperate for you to come through in these areas. Father, maybe be in our family, maybe in our marriage, our, fam- our children. Lord, it might be out in the world. It might be a, 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 a co-worker, a a place of unforgiveness in our heart that, God, we're still holding on, and, and we're just wanting to get back there, get, get back to kind of wholeness. Father, I pray that you would just break through that deception and bring transformation in our life right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that these areas that have been toilsome, that have been lacking life, God, I pray that as we give them to you and allow you to be God over these areas, Father, that we are expectant to see your life, your abundant peace, your strength to fill this place. Fill our life with your strength and your power. Father, we're all broken and humble. And God, I pray that we would just come, yield our lives to you, and say that you are a great God. You are the great God over all creation. And, Lord, these lesser gods come about because your people have kept silent. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us a voice of confidence in your word, that the way you created it all it hasn't changed. So, Lord, we thank you for your life and thank you for your word. Lord, open up our relationship with you as we navigate through this uh, portion of your word in Isaiah. God, capture our hearts. Capture our vision and our imagination. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, with that, happy Sunday. Go get it. Wait on the Lord as you're getting it. Amen. Praise God.